All right. Greetings, friends and comrades. Daniel here with Richard Seymour back again with us. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Um, yes, the last time we spoke, uh, we were talking about self-help uh, for a very dynamic conversation about psychoanalysis, the state of Lacanian leftism. Um, and Richard's somebody that I think has such a broad grasp on theoretical matters on the left, as well as um, journalistic and current events and and much more practical uh, dynamics of the kind of conjuncture that we find ourselves in that I've invited him to join us for what is going to be somewhat of a spontaneous conversation about um, and perhaps slightly idiosyncratic in the way that I've decided to frame it, which is that, you know, there's these kind of new currents uh, in Marxist theory that have popped up somewhat recently, although they Certainly, one could make an argument that these currents represent trends which have remained consistent. Uh, but but um, perhaps you agree, Richard, with my framework, or perhaps you slightly disagree. But my sense is that one of the conversations that we're now having on the, on the left, on the socialist left, um, broader than just, let's say, the Marxist left, uh, is, is the question around uh, the introduction of this new movement in ecological thought, left ecological thought called degrowth communism uh, from the um, Saito, who's written several texts on this. And his, his readership is um, extraordinarily large. He's, he's sold half a million copies of his works in Asian, uh, predominantly Asian countries. Um, I don't know if you understand why that is the case, why he is so popular. That would be an interesting aside to ask. But nonetheless, he has put forward a very, I would say, compelling argument, but yet nonetheless problematic argument. Um, and it has already elicited uh, a, a healthy debate. The other side, the other sort of tendency that I wanted to, to flag and to discuss with you is what I'm calling neo-Kautskyism. Karl Kautsky is known to us really as the renegade Kautsky from Lenin's famous dismissal or so-called dismissal of Kautsky. And it's interesting that at a certain point in time, um, his legacy as the so-called Pope of Marxism uh, sort of got washed away because of Lenin's strong critique. However, in my reading, Richard, I'm feeling that in the wake of the collapse of Corbyn in the collapse of Podemos and Syriza, in the collapse of the Sanders coalition in America, there seems to be a kind of interest in a revisitation of what we might call a productivist, working class oriented form of socialism. Thinkers like Matt Huber um, represent such an orientation. Jacobin Magazine represents such an orientation. We're already seeing um, emerge this kind of loose position in and of course their response to the degrowth communism piece is i think first and foremost a problem of rhetoric right which is how could a degrowth communist idea or conception putting aside our careful exegetical understanding of this in marx's texts how could it ever realistically circumvent the dominance of neoliberal austerity ideology if we're promoting this on the left so these, this is the sort of um, framework that I'm proposing our conversation begin from. So perhaps we could start, Richard, with your thoughts on, on how I've posed the problem. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you make of it? Um, that seems fine to me. It describes the polarities of the current debate. Obviously, we look forward to the, that opposition being sublated at some point. Um, I... I read Matt Huber's book carefully um, and I got a lot out of it. And I think that the um, emphasis upon class is welcome after decades in which Marxists, honestly, um, Marxists had not written a lot about uh, uh, ecology for a long time until jo John Bellamy Foster and others came along. Um, and um, even then it, I mean, um, it didn't lead to a broad strategic orientation toward building class power for ecological purposes. It didn't actually lead to a, a full-scale um, reconstruction of uh, Marxist political thought. Um, 
And to be honest with you, I don't think that Matt Huber's got there either. Um, I think that he's uh, proposed, I mean, his analysis of uh, the roots of climate change is great. Uh, he poses some very hard strategic points, which we uh, have to take into account. Um, he's quite right that the working class is um, the potential agency that would have the disruptive capacity to leverage um, a, a sort of green transition into being. He's right also, I think, that, you know, we're not on the brink of a revolutionary transition, uh, you know, much as we may lament that fact, but the social composition just isn't there. The class consciousness just isn't there and therefore he talks about how can we where are the weak points how can we um leverage power where it counts most and he talks about building power and utility workers okay all of that's you know arguable up to a point um i'm honestly not sure that the working class is um uh, going to play um, the lead role in ecological politics uh, for reasons that Andreas Malm has pointed out, um, namely that large sectors of the working class, the organized working class, um, um, and the best organized workers, uh, you know, often happen to be the ones who are slightly better paid, uh, have relative advantages over the majority of disorganized workers. Um, and... Uh, you know, when it comes to um, what Gramsci called the sort of um, economic corporate mode of organizing, you know, that's they, they're, 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 they're most inclined toward a kind of narrow corporatist or sectional uh, sort of mode of logic when it comes to their interests. Um, and certainly, you know, the record of trade unions uh, involved in the energy sector um and in sort of uh, fossil intensive sectors uh, hasn't been great. So I'm wary of that part of it, but I can see there's an argument there. Um, where I think it becomes, it's in danger of being insolvent actually uh, has to do with um, the problem of consciousness. Huber argues that we need to return to the idea of objective class interests and fight for objective class interests. He tries to give an account of what an objective class interest looks like in ecological terms, um, framing it not in terms of, you know, uh, we're all poisoned by capitalism, you know, we're all damaged by um, the way capitalism ruins our environment, we're all coming to face to face with extreme weather and so on, because I think he sort of sees that Many, many working class people see all this stuff and cling harder to, you know, fossil denialism or fossil politics or just feel utterly um, impotent about it. Um, but he says that basically the defining condition of the working class is actually its separation from nature. It's separation from um, uh, power over nature and power in nature. Um, and so I think there's there's something to that. But. This ties back to the question of degrowth and the, the very aggressive way in which he attacks degrowth as a mode of austerity politics. I think actually historically and politically illiterate on this point. I mean, uh, comparing the origins of degrowth to the origins of 1970s austerity, uh, there are two different moments and they have very different relationship to capitalism and its growth strategies, particularly um, austerity is about um, resetting capitalism to enable much more intensive growth uh, for the the ruling class uh, for capital um, degrowth and its origins in the sort of um, the um, series of um, movements uh, beginning with you know uh, Earth Day and you know all the rest of it um, that was about restraining capital's growth and just democratizing um, the, the the fruits of it. And I think that's what degrowth is really about. So I don't think that uh, comparing it to austerity is very productive. But the other side of this is, um, I said, I said it's about consciousness. There is no interest that is purely objective, because every time you assert an interest, you're taking an, an intentional stance towards something, even if it's a perfectly rational intentional stance. And that, I think, is a crucial distinction. There are rational interests and there are irrational interests. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, possible to discuss how rational class interests can be formed. And there, this is what Lukács was trying to talk about in terms of the distinction between empirical class consciousness and imputed class consciousness. How do we, um, how do we actualize that? 
Um, so I think once you've um, read it in those terms and see it in terms as a problem of consciousness, as a problem of the organization of consciousness, you start to see it's not going to be sufficient to defer to the most um, bottom line kind of consciousness, the most narrow, I want to have more for myself and my family. That's important. And we mustn't be dismissive of that when so many American workers, the majority, I think, are living paycheck to paycheck, right? Um, uh, you know, but you, you you start there, but you don't end there. You've got to develop the consciousness, and that means you've got to uh, educate people, um, if education is the correct term. Um, uh, you've got to enable people's self-education, uh, if you like, um, so that they can uh, break with the ideology of growth, which is actually, you know, I mean... Not only, you know, I mean, we can talk about uh, capital accumulation as growth. Obviously, we want to break that. But even the ideology of growth really emerges as a Cold War uh, ideology uh, in competition with communism. It's counter-utopian. It's counter-communist. We need to break the hold of that and show that actually your standard of living, your quality of life, is what's going to improve. It's not about, you know, having more uh, toys and chuchkas. It's not about having as much stuff as possible. It's about living a better life. And then raising the utopian question, what would a better life be? Um, so I think that there are ways of um, bringing together degrowth and the, the sort of class-based strategy. Um, but to get there, I think you have to confront the perennial problem of consciousness. Um, and I think that that's somewhat missing in the Kautskyite sort of productivist approach. Yeah, I'm, I think that's that's helpful. I would say that the Kautskyist vision for the transition to socialism did have a sort of teleology, let's call it a teleological premise at times, which was that a sort of poor reading of the late Marx of capital in which the capitalism sort of falls apart on its own on its own legs um, and that therefore the question of proletarian agency is is sidelined to an extent and that then allows for a particular theory of collaborationism and revisionism to enter into the picture uh, as opposed to i guess you could say a more leninist orientation that would be insisting on um, a different form of proletarian party organization um, yeah, I think all those points you make are very sound. One of the dangers, of course, is the education piece in the sense that we do run a risk of a sort of technocratic idea of the working class in which we are saying, well, vote for us socialists, whatever that means, because that presupposes that we've somehow taken a hold of the Labour Party or the Democratic Party in the United States, which after the collapse of Sanders does not seem likely. Uh, and then at, from that point, you can trust us because we're, we have your interests. We got your back. Uh, that is both naive. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the neo Kautskyist position is holding that line. But I'm rather trying to suggest that perhaps we're at this very interesting moment um, in which we need to think about alignment with bourgeois parties more rigorously than we have before. Um, that's what the neo Kautskyist impulse indicates. The other thing that it indicates to me is a, a difficult question about class uh, interests within the context of the so-called professional problem, the, prof the new class, the professional managerial class problem, which seems to me to come down to a question of interest, but also a question about, um, on the one hand, you have the kind of neo kautskyist suspicion that technocratic PMC elites sort of ideologically have a hostility to the advancement of working class interests, right? And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, to what extent do you find those critiques um, sound or convincing? And to what extent are they a detriment to building the type of solidarity on the left that's needed, especially for people like us who are sort of, who are a bit in a foot, in a foot of academia, who, who do have a foothold in some cases, elite academia, are also entrepreneurial, right? So we're caught in this contradictory place ourselves. 
and we often don't even have the uh, capacity to recognize our own positionality within these debates, nonetheless. So you have a PMC debate amongst the PMC, right? That becomes, um, in fact, it's not even a debate often, if we're honest. It's usually uh, these two silos that don't adequately talk. Thoughts on that? Well, one thing that I think Huber is very convincing about is the inadequacy of information. So if we're talking about education in the sense of we're going to give you all the information you need to know and you're going to be able to make a rational choice on that basis, obviously that's not going to work um, because that's not how uh, consciousness is formed. Um, in terms of the PMC stuff, um, Huber's analysis obviously incorporates an element of culture of consciousness. In other words, there are certain ways in which uh, professional managerial class people think they overestimate the value of knowledge, they're conditioned to do so by their uh, by their social being, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think there's something to that. I'm not entirely convinced by the integrity of the concept uh, uh, of the PMC as a class. Um, I, you know, I mean, I'm fairly orthodox in this sense, you know, I think you know, the, there's broadly the working class, the capitalist class, and there's a sort of um, a middling strata, um, which we call the middle class, but which is rather unstable and differentiates internally. Um, and I think the PMC, broadly speaking, might be a, a section of the middle class, but it, it it's often, uh, organi you know, just discussed in such a polemical fashion that it's hard to uh, make much headway with it. Um, I think that this is a symptom of the absence of class power, because if we had a well-organized working class, we wouldn't be talking about the PMC, and we wouldn't be adopting this slightly paranoid, victimized way of talking about the PMC as if they're the ones that are doing this to us, they're the ones that are pulling the wool over our eyes. So no, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think that's um, a helpful starting point, but I'm not going to dismiss the fact that... Um, Manifestly, the middle class uh, or, and frequently just downright bourgeois leaderships of climate politics have produced uh, a style and a way of doing things that uh, it, it completely runs, uh, it, it repeatedly runs up against a brick wall. We're going to give you all the facts and they find that doesn't work. And then they say, oh, well, what we've got to do is give people hopeful stories. You know, we're scaring people. What we want to do is uh, sound like JFK or Martin Luther King or something like that and inspire people. And that doesn't work. And they become very frustrated. Um, and, you know, the sort of Huber, uh, Neo Kautsky kind of approaches, we'll talk about people's class interests and you'll engage them. You're, you're, you're a bunch of um, uh, sort of remote um, often academics or NGOized professionals, um, and you're not talking to people on the level of their interest. In fact, the way in which you talk about climate politics is a politics of less, um, you know, using less stuff, using less plastic bags, even if it's not degrowth. It's frequently about, you know, making little personal sacrifices here and there. That's not going to resonate with ordinary people who already uh, have very little. Um, the fact is, though, Ultimately, I think there's a kind of mechanistic uh, understanding of class consciousness in that sense, because I think that working class people um, and just people generally, they don't make political decisions on that basis. And the last few years have shown us this, this idea of enlightened self-interest that we've inherited from classical political economy. Um, where people calculate, you know, have some rational hierarchy of personal utilities, priorities, and they calculate the best uh, outcomes for them. It doesn't really work out that way. People actually repeatedly make sacrifices um, by voting for politicians whom they know will make their personal material situation worse. But however, they expect them to redeem them on a symbolic level. Voting for Trump on the basis of a grand abstraction like the nation. The nation, nobody's ever met a nation. The nation is a, a conscious construction, uh, obviously mediated through social relations and institutions, but it's not an object, it's not a thing that you encounter in the world. Um, but it motivates millions and millions of people uh, in a way that appeals to class doesn't. Um, 
at this particular point, let's say. So that's an interesting fact in and of itself. Um, I think Lacanians would say that actually people enjoy making a sacrifice. That's part of the jouissance of politics. You know, um, I remember when we had the Brexit stuff in the UK, and that was still the dominant issue of the day. And they would interview people who voted for Brexit, and they'd say, so the experts said you're going to lose this many jobs, you're going to lose uh, employment, um, uh, your living standards will get a bit worse. Do you think it was worth it? And most of the time, mo the majority of people answering would say, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it was, it's worth it if, we, if it breaks up the UK. It's worth it if it uh, loses a bunch of jobs. And I don't think we can be just contemptuous of that because basically everybody who's involved in politics has something that is more important than the bottom line. And in fact, whatever is the most important thing in your politics, you'll always find that there's something that's more important than it. Uh, I think that's just structural. So, um, this is where um, I think uh, Saito's reading, rereading of Marx, although it's um, largely historical philological um, reading that doesn't really engage with the strategic point, um, does offer us some resources because what he's really trying to do there, obviously in his Hegelian way, or I mean, it doesn't really openly declare itself as a Hegelian exercise, but essentially it's trying to... Um, push through the antinomies of Marx to bring it to a higher level, a post-historical materialism, um, which um, renews the sort of uh, pre-capitalist utopianism on a higher level. Let's go back and revisit those pre-capitalist communes and so on and see what we can learn from them. Um, and although I think that the evidence for this is patchy, you know, the evidence that Marx was moving away from historical materialism, etc., I think it's, it's fairly thin and tendentious, but there is an effort there to cultivate uh, the what Marx and Engels referred to as the active side, which is the ideal, right? It's uh, the side of consciousness. It's the side of, uh, in this case, freedom. So that raises, uh, to me, an interesting question. You know, we, we have had a, a legacy which, in some ways, you could say it's Kautskyite, but frankly, um, this had a, an element, it, there was an element of it in Bolshevism, there was an element of it certainly metastasized into Stalinism, um, an element of productivism all the way through Marxism, actually. Um, and it's the idea that we're going to escape the realm of necessity by building up the productive forces to such an extent that... Um, you know, we can treat most necessary material goods as if they're free goods because there'll be such an abundance. And, you know, uh, we will be able to focus on living our best lives. Okay, that's a cheap way to put it, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, um, Lukács somewhere says, uh, the method is politics, but the object is culture. That's the idea. It's a utopian idea that we're going to actually, uh, I just want to uh, mention since I just brought up Lukács there, there's a lovely story about him. I don't know if you know this, um, an anecdote in which um, uh, during the Hungarian Soviet, the short-lived Hungarian Soviet, when he was cultural commissar, um, one of his uh, lifelong friends said to him, what's going to become, George, of the fairy tales that you and I both loved in our childhood under communism? And he said, they'll come true. The stones will speak and the trees will speak. And then the commissariat issued a decree under his signature ordering that children up to the age of 14 years should be uh, recited fairy tales for their edification. Um, that's um, the utopian uh, George Lukács. Um, and I think that um, that's really what, I mean, you know, Hebrew sometimes uses utopian as a curse word, but it's actually an active part of the um, uh, Marxist project. And that's wow. why coming back to this problem of consciousness okay wow and now, now i have to uh, jump in here it's a very interesting debate of course that lukacs would have with ernst block on the question of utopia because i mean i can cite some three or four examples of his pushback against utopianism um uh, on the one hand he pushes back against his own his own youthful nietzschean utopianism um where he rejects the entirety of the theory of the novel for example 
Um, and then in reflecting on history and class consciousness, he also in the 19, early 1960s preface, you'll remember, he I think he ends that with a warning against utopianism, which was also why he was not interested in Ernst Bloch studying uh, medieval forms of rebellion. He thought that this would lead to a kind of fundamental confusion about proletarian rev modern proletarian revolution. But it is interesting to hear you say that. And I, I certainly can see this element. If we want to call it utopian, we don't need to fall into a semantical schism there. I think you're right that there is an element of utopianism, even in Lukács. And I would also say, going back to your point about what I understand to be really, you use the word sacrifice. I would say it's resentment, right? Which is that resentments, political resentments, have rational kernels to them, right? It's, it is a fact that we are driven to some extent at a collective level for the remediation of harm. I mean, Ron Cier teaches us that politics emerges when we have a conflict over the definition of harms in some sense. So I don't think we should be too afraid to, on the left, uh, not, I, I don't want to say embrace a politics of resentment, but perhaps have better literacy about how it might appear, which is difficult to do. It's difficult to do precisely because we are ensnared in liberal, neoliberal, bourgeois institutions in which um, the ide ideology of those institutions is that there is no alternative, right? So anytime one is advocating an alternative, you are accused of a kind of resentment populist politics, right? You are accused of a kind of affective breach in the norm, you know, so there's a certain repression that comes from a left-wing embrace of the politics of resentment, which of course, Richard, is, ties me back to Nietzsche because I see Nietzsche as actually in a paradoxical way clouding the politics of resentment because in fact, he's very much opposed to the politics of resentment. He's a thinker that doesn't want the politics of resentment to appear. That actually has a negative effect, I think, on the left because then we can't enter into that terrain who can't really debate with Trump at that level, if that makes sense. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Do you see it perhaps as a task of the left, if we are talking class consciousness, etc., to dig into these different murky, difficult, dark regions of, of the politics of resentment? Yes, um, and I think you're. I, I think you're right about Nietzsche. Though I, I have to say, if any um, philosopher was riddled with resentment, um, at, you know, in, in travestying his opponents, it was him. Um, and I think that um, his understanding of resentment as slave morality is just fundamentally wrong um, and empirically um, uh, stupid. Um, Certainly his portrayal of Jesus Christ as um, a weak, um, beautiful soul who kind of uh, resented um, more powerful, strong-willed people, noble people. Um, that isn't, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, I would say that's a counter myth, right? That's his attempt to uh, answer Christianity with his own mythology. Um, the historical Jesus as understood by Christians is basically somebody who loves his enemies no resentment whatsoever. So I think he's he's got it wrong. I think that resentment of the kind that he's talking about, which is reactive, um, which revels in its sense of victimhood, um, which d derives its self-worth from the sense of being harmed, I'm good because they're bad. Um, I think that's uh, much more of um, a, a petty bourgeois ideology today um, than uh, a sort of a slave morality. I think um, it's it's not uninteresting that um, what William Connolly calls the currents, uh, the underground currents of existential revenge in daily life, are really um, organised around petty exercises of power. So you encounter a bank manager who doesn't want to give you a loan because they don't like the look of you, doesn't like the cut of your jib. You, you encounter um, a neighbor who likes bossing you around, telling you off for the, you know, the way you keep your garden. You encounter a social worker, um, a middle manager. It's not the bosses. Um, it's the middle managers who are the most 
actively vengeful and resentful. And those are the classes of people, by and large, who vote for the, the new far right, who vote for Bolsonaro, who vote for Trump and, you know, all the rest of it. I mean, this the, the class composition is complicated, but there's that core element to it. So, um, and, you know, just to say about Nietzsche, I, you know, I, I came on here wanting to troll you about Nietzsche, but um, I haven't finished reading your book about it yet, so I can't, I can't be, you know, convincingly trolling on this point. I only want to say, like, I think it's self-evident that Nietzsche is, as you argue, a reactionary philosopher. I think that Lucerdo um, and uh, John Riemann are pretty convincing, both on this point and on the um, hermeneutical politics of innocence uh, on the part of sort of left Nietzsche and deconstructivists, etc. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's essential to grasp this. I do think that there's a sort of amorphous, um, well, not amorphous, actually, a kind of romantic anti-capitalism there. There's a romantic rebelliousness there, which has certain resources. Um, I don't agree um, with the sort of late Lukacian reading, uh, which to me is just intellectual sec sectarianism in that his former self, um, that uh, Nietzsche is the sort of... Um, uh, sort of ancestor of fascism. I think it's more complicated than that. I think the problem really with the Nietzsche is that his only objection to fascism would have been that it's too vulgar. You know, it's a, it's sort of base, um, sort of plebeian uh, politics. Um, I think he would have wanted something more aristocratic. But um, uh, look, I, I know that um, uh, there's um, a desire to sort of reckon with the legacy of Nietzsche um, in a more honest way. Um, and also that's that sort of, that goes along with a tendency towards a more interested, more interest in a kind of rationalist legacy from Lukács and Heidegger, uh, not Heidegger, sorry, Hegel. Um, yeah, the opposite of that, yeah. <laughs> well, in, in, Heidegger is interesting because um, Lucien Goldman, as you know, makes the case that Heidegger's um, being in time is a direct response to history and class consciousness. Look, I just want to say about Lukács, um, I, I think I think he paid a high price for convincing himself that he had to be a materialist. I think he was fundamentally an idealist thinker. Uh, I think that he never overcame that because, and it was futile to try. Uh, Daniel Andres Lopez's book, great book, Lukács and the Absolute, makes the case that essentially he tried in the 20s to make the proletariat bear the full weight of the absolute, of the actualization of the idea. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I think persuasively, um, and I think that that is fundamentally an idealist commitment, but I don't see that as being a departure from Marxism for reasons we can get into. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to offer several provocations here, but I think really... By the um, 1930s, he's adjusted himself so much uh, to, you know, uh, destroying his own former subjectivism, abstract ethicism, and so on. He's accommodated to rail politic. He's ended up um, sort of um, accommodating to the Zinoviavite Bulgarians in the Comintern. He's He's writing a book to deal with objections by Laszlo Rudas, who is, he knows is a profoundly corrupt and cowardly figure he despises. Um, he's had to take all these people seriously. By the early 1930s, he's utterly demoralized and is making his peace with a, a dictatorship that whose brutality of which he could not have been entirely aware, but he couldn't have been entirely unaware either. Um, and becomes, in my opinion, quite a conservative and orthodox thinker. That doesn't mean that I'm dismissing everything he wrote after that. I think if you read The Young Hegel, you're going to get a lot from it. The Social Ontology of Being. I think less so the essays on realism. I think the destruction of reason is just an exercise in orthodox um, thinking rather than the kind of imminent reading uh, of these uh, tendencies that would be necessary. Um, but I think that, um, you know, that, that that's that's why that's how I read his uh, a war on the utopian el element, which um, frankly I think if you if you try and expunge the utopian element, you lose what is essential what is essential to Marxism. It's not all about material causation, you know, which is basically bottom up, you know, me mechanical causation in that sense. Um, it's about downward causation, the causation of the free consciousness. Um, and the whole point of Marxism is how do you how do you understand the articulation of these two dimensions? I think fundamentally 
uh, Marx, while asserting materialism, ends up with an ide idealist coherence. Um, and I think that is, you know, that is fine, that is necessary, that's not a problem with Marxism. Um, but I think that um, if you try and expunge uh, the aspect of it, which has to do with striving, so we talk about consciousness, we're talking about, you know, philosophers of consciousness talk about qualia, they talk about intentionality, they talk about, you know, the possibility of abstract thought and so on. But a fundamental part of it is uh, that there is um, a teleological dimension to freedom. There is some sense in which consciousness is geared in a particular direction. Um, and uh, Hegel is, is onto this in a very particular way. Um, and so freedom is basically teleological in that sense, something to do with the self-development of the spirit, whatever, however you want to define that. Um, and I think that, um, therefore, utopian thinking is about um, defining, um, uh, anticipating what the, in this, in this sense, the absolute would look like. Um, and I think it was... Um, I think it, it cost him a great deal in terms of his personal morale, in terms of his politics, and in terms of his his writing style. I mean, for God's sake, if you read the theory of the novel in soul and form, the beautiful, tragic messianic tone, the lyricism, is just lost. Um, and I, I know, I mean, I, I am fundamentally a romantic, you know, uh, I'm into the transcendentalists and all of this stuff, but um, um, I think that I think he would have... Um, I think the failure of his project in the 1920s cost him dearly. Uh, let me just put it like that. Sure. Yeah. So really, really great threads. Um, I would, I would flag the question of the absolute back into the problem of neo-Kantianism for which is his formation. And the problem with the absolute as understood within that framework is that it's a political epistemology around social reality. So proletarian consciousness becomes about, a privileged Weltanschauung of accessing higher truths, higher social truths, which includes the truths of social antagonism, etc., for which you run into the the Nietzsche, where Nietzsche, in a paradoxical sense, emerges, especially within Bolshevism as well, is Nietzsche will basically kind of relativize the question of this neo-Kantian notion that okay, well, if the proletarian has some unique vantage point. Uh, on a perspectival vantage point, um, how is that uh, going to be imbued within the vanguard, right? And this is why Gramsci expresses a lot of questions and reservations, even Lenin expresses reservations about Nietzsche within specifically, lead. Uh, you could call it a question, I would say, Richard, of proletarian leadership in some sense, because the problem of imputed consciousness remains. And when he writes his addendum, his revision to history and class consciousness, he relocates it as an issue. And we should also remember that when he wrote that text, he was actually on the outside. He was a part of an illegal communist movement party, which was not in line with the orthodox or predominant party forms. It was a kind of, if you like, an anti-representational treatise in that sense. Um, so I would say that, and I agree with Lopez, that we need to, in essence, expand the sites for thinking the absolute beyond just labor, beyond just labor, that labor is, in a sense, too limited. And this is an, oh, a relic of, of Marx's 19th century proletariat, industrial proletariat, which we no longer have the same uh, access to at the same time. One of the things that I see uh, that I don't see that I would like to see in the Saito degrowth position is what I would call the absence of worldview, but worldview building project. And I want to get your thoughts on this. It's a concept that I work with, uh, which is that, OK, Lukács actually puts forward a claim that the project of consciousness building, class consciousness building, must, in fact, be more comprehensively orientated. Right not merely in this kind of um, struggle, conflictual, political terrain, but must infuse, as you said, the sphere of culture, which is why when he breaks from Max Weber and the liberal Nietzschean utopianism that he was a part of, that he was trained in, as because Lukács 
was an arist he was from a minor aristocratic family you know? when he when he witnesses what happens in 1917 he says i'm done with that it changes his name right he becomes a communist and he calls it a conversion uh, but at that moment uh, he wants to say that the bolsheviks had a higher worldview than the highest achievements of the bourgeoisie now if we look and we apply that same notion of worldview building today that actually in my view is interesting because what that shows is the necessity of the creation of working class culture working class institutions working class parties for which we have a pretty profound deficit in today if we are honest i want to get your thoughts on that because of course michael heinrich says that the age of worldview marxism is over and done very fine if that's true i think that we have a conundrum on our hands if that's really true which is we fall into a spontaneous insurrectionist form of communism which does which throws the question of organization out the window and that to me is not what we should be doing I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there, Luke Hatch, even in his um, later years, um, I remember reading something that he wrote in response to the Prague Spring, I think. Um, and this is uh, about the self-education of the working class, essentially. And, you know, when he talks about consciousness is, is capable of being educated, what he means is essentially that it's capable of becoming socialist because essentially what socialism would be is the self-education of, uh, of, of, of everybody, um, class having been abolished in that sense. Um, and um, in order to get there, you have to start building up the um, sort of um, insurgent cultures within the interstices of capitalism. Um, and that has to be oriented towards some sort of telos. I mean, it has to have uh, uh, some... I mean, here I, I take a cue from Alistair McIntyre. I don't agree with the, his overall philosophical purview, but I think he's very sharp on some of these points. And on this issue, he says, Marxism basically uh, is the one in, enlightenment ideology that inherits from religion its total grasp of the questions of being and history and where human humankind stands in it and how it can orient itself towards... Uh, some kind of final objective. Um, and I think that um, that's that's perfectly correct. Um, and as soon as you say worldviews is over and we're not we're no longer about building worldviews, what are we doing? Um, you know, I mean, what what do we mean by socialism in that case? It becomes and and I think uh, to be honest with you, this is one of the reasons why, I started to have problems with Althusserian Marxism. I mean, Althusserian Marxism, of course, uh, you know, was my position for uh, a long time, and I was pretty hardcore about it. But whenever it came to the question of uh, consciousness and subjectivity, I always assumed that was a problem that it would get round to solving. Um, that the eliminative position uh, of Althusser, that consciousness is a bourgeois construct, that, you know, in the Foucauldian sense, the, the self is just the site of power, rather than being the site of freedom. I was assumed that would be that would work itself out somewhere. Um, and, you know, Butler famously pointed out in one of her essays on Althusser that essentially his whole notion of ideology, of interpolation, presupposes a subjectivity in this place, in this case, one of guilt. You know, the policeman says, hey, you, and you go, me? Um, you know, so there's um, already um, a, a sort of uh, subjectivist substratum um, there. Um, so the attempt to epicureanize Marx, if you like, to um, to de-idealize Marx, that's what he was trying to do, failed. I mean, he, he ended up with an account of consciousness that split between a mechanical version of reproduction, ideological reproduction, and a Lacan-derived notion of inter interpolation, which actually is basically an, a, an idealist construction. Um, even though you assert, uh, as of course he must, and you know, he, Althusserians have been one of the few groups on the left who actually, on the Marxist left, who actually assert this, that all of these processes, conscious processes, are thoroughly material. 
Um, by and large, you don't actually find that assertion in Lenin, in Marx, in Engels, and so on. Um, so it's um, it's it's a it's a problem um, because at that stage, how do you account for the capacity to build any alternative? How do you account for the capacity for freedom? How do you account for the capacity to develop worldviews? Um, and it's not good enough to talk about bad subject, uh, bad subject formation, you know, like the the breakdown and so on, the contradictions in the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because that just introduces a note of indeterminacy. Unless there is fundamentally a capacity for rational freedom in the human subject, which is uh, part of what it means to be a conscious being, um, then you don't really have an explanation, you don't really have Marxism. And the involution of uh, Althusser's politics in the 1980s, I think, really follows. Um, I, I don't want to over overstate this because we can over politicize theory um, and assume that it has a direct logical correlation in politics. Often it doesn't. And there are many routes to right wing, to the right, as it were. Um, but um, I think that, um, you know, the breakdown of Althusserianism was a result of its imminent logic if you like this is this is very powerful stuff and i'm now mm, tracking the audience listening to our conversation and i'm for their benefit wanting to ask a couple clarifying questions so when you say that the althusserian position on subjectivity is kind of an idealist one um could you unpack that for us a bit more in the distinction between materialism and idealism just so i think i I think I, I'm, I'm grasping you, but for the benefit of listeners. Right. So as I mean, obviously, there are going to be various different iterations of materialism. Um, but I take the basic materialist position to be that there is one substance, um, uh, one uh, sort of type of stuff which um, doesn't depend on anything else for its existence, and that is matter. Um, and then from there, you can say, when you confront the problem of consciousness, because you've expunged subject uh, from uh, matter, you've said, uh, you know, but this was a, a, an experimental condition of the empirical sciences, but you've turned that into a metaphysics. You said matter doesn't contain anything like subjectivity, and therefore the, you get the mind-body problem. Consciousness is a problem, okay? Um and so the materialist strategy would be to say that um, either that consciousness is itself somehow a physical thing going on, which is very difficult because nothing, nothing in the physical world has the characteristics of consciousness, nothing. Um, uh, and it would be very hard to see how it would, how that would happen. Um, and you end up in various cul-de-sacs like naturalist panpsychism and so on. Um, or you can say, well, consciousness is not quite material. And indeed, many Marxists say this is not quite material. Um, in fact, it's not material at all, but it emerges from the material. Um, we don't quite know how. And I think then you end up with a problem. Because uh, in order for something to emerge from something else, at a, uh, something at a higher level to emerge from a lower level, it has to be latently present in the lower level. So a traffic jam can emerge, if you like, from a deposit of iron ore because it is latent within <laughs> iron ore to be that it can be made into steel and that can be made into a chassis of a car and so on. Um, the idea that consciousness, uh, with its characteristics, can be... Um, can emerge from matter as it's currently understood. We can reorganize our understanding of matter. And I know that Zizek and Adrian Johnston are working on uh, a different approach to matter, um, not successfully yet in my view, but nonetheless, it's there. Um, but as we currently understand matter, it's, it's, it's impossible to extrapolate that emergence. And I think that Althusser struggles to come up with a thoroughly uh, materially reductive account of consciousness. He ends up with two um, sides of it uh, which don't cohere. Uh, one side of it is basically one that relies upon um, the presupposition of a kind of subjectivity, of an interiority that he denies exists or wants to deny exists. And the other is uh, basically mechanical. Um, but the, even on that other side, you would, uh, you would have to raise the question of what's motivating it? What drives it along? Um, 
Arthur Sarah wants to say that um, capitalism in the Marxist sense is a process without a subject. Now, that is not an historical process. That is a, an empirical science process. That's a laboratory process. Um, but in order for the, the, the whole system of Marxism to move forward, I mean, notoriously, uh, Marx borrowed extensively from Hegel's logic when he wrote Capital. And so it's a dialectic of categories. And so the self-movement of the categories is dialectical in this sense. Um, it's conceptual, it's conscious, um, and that's why it can work. Marx's attempt to expunge Hegel and get rid of all of that sort of idealist claptrap, as he would have seen it, um, uh, results in a question of, okay, so what's propelling things forward? What keeps the system going? Why do people keep acting as Träger? The German term Träger is, um, in, in, for Althusser, like a, a mechanical term. You're the bearer of a structure. You don't have any agency or functionality. But actually, the term, if you look at it, um, really implies something more active. A Träger is somebody who, like, carries a spear or carries a knife. It's a, it's a bearer in that sense, somebody who is an active um, part of the system. And so the question is, why do we reproduce capitalism? Why do we keep going going on? Why do we keep buying stuff uh, that we know is destroying the planet or doing stuff that we know is destroying the planet? That's a sort of relevant question here. And often the answer is, well, the, the choices aren't that great. You know, um, we are materially confined. True. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, you're not going to get to grips with this unless you can get to grips with the um, the way in which capitalism is in a certain dimension, uh, an organization, a collective organization, a mediation of consciousness. When Marx says that uh, social being determines consciousness, not the other way around, the obvious um, uh, sort of hermeneutical question is, okay, so what is this social being if not conscious action? You know, the relations in which we form with one another are Whatever we whatever we think we're doing, we intend something by going to work or uh, forming a relationship with someone, whatever it is. So in a way, uh, you run the risk of ending up in a circular logic. Consciousness determines consciousness. Um, so uh, in order to escape that, that's why you need the dialectic. That's why you need to sort of set up a, a, an opposition that sort of. But ultimately, I think because the dialectic is uh, driven along. Um, and this is true in Hegel, and Marx straightforwardly takes it from Hegel, uh, driven along by um, uh, the self-movement of the absolute, right? It's uh, that that's what motivates the, you know, that's why the, the, that's the necessity of one conceptual uh, development following from another. Um, and that hence uh, what Lukács calls the ontological omnipotence of reason in, in Hegel, because for him, uh, reason is God, and God is imminent in history. And so his whole project is basically um, a theodicy. It's a justification for God. He says, yes, the slaughter bench of history is terrible, but it's also rational. It's necessary part of the uh, dialectic of God's self-development, and we are a part of that. And the ultimate aim is freedom. I think it's a, that's a highly problematic theology, by the way, but when it comes to um, how that... Um, works itself out in uh, Marx's dialectic. I think ultimately his way of rendering um, uh, matter and mind, you know, uh, coherent, uh, pulling them together in a dialectic ultimately is idealist because mm -hmm. it depends upon this self-moving dialectic. And also, I mean, if it isn't, if it weren't to be idealist, I think you would end up with another problem, which would be that it would be dualist. Um, it would be, um, uh, working with two different kinds of substance and, and how they work together doesn't really make any sense. And then you would be saying, okay, so, or you'd be left with the question, okay, so we have, we can ground our commitment to socialist freedom in some property of human consciousness, some tendency in it towards uh, freedom. Um, and therefore we escape the problem of, you know, because uh, in, in, Brute metaphysical materialism, all values are t totally groundless. That's Nietzsche's position. You know, uh, all values are totally groundless. It's differential strife all the way down. And the best you can do is spiritualize enmity, come up with some sort of pluralism, you know. 
um, which you know I have some I have some residual sympathy for that. But if you really want communism, you know you you need to um, be able to ground it somewhere. Um, and uh, so you know you could either um, sort of ground it in something, you know, the anthropos, some some sort of human essence. Then you get into trouble because what are you saying? There's such a thing as human nature. That's quite conservative, you know. Maybe, um, or you can say that there is some sense in which reality is fundamentally rational. There's some sense in which reality is, in that sense, mind-like. Um, and I think that that's the sense in which I think um, Marxism is a kind of proletarian idealism. And I don't expect to convince anyone. I hope to produce the odd existential crisis in making these arguments, but I don't expect to convince anyone. But if um, if I provoke um, maybe, uh, let's say, a, a, a less, uh, less certitude about our materialism, if I provoke people into thinking um, that when people get up and use materialism in a polemical sense and dismiss all the old bourgeois idealist claptrap, um, that they're not necessarily being true to their own politics or their own commitments. Performatively, there's a contradiction there. That mm -hmm. would be a good start. Bravo. Uh, it's such a delight to, to have you back, Richard. Um, a couple couple of thoughts. I'm, I'm reminded here of the very important uh, scholar in France, Isabel Garo, who studies uh, the legacy, the practical a legacy for socialist and communist politics of Althusserianism. And her basic position on Althusser was that the effect of the Althusserian school, which she, by the way, makes a very interesting argument that we should understand pretty much the entirety of French theory, their understanding of Marxism through the prism of Althusser's understanding of Marxism which was an understanding of Marxism in her reading, which moved away from a materialist analysis of political economy and resulted in a politicization of theory. So it, it sort of granted the theorist a profound political wherewithal for interventions, but also presupposed an understanding of class antagonism from the theoretical position, but also from the position of discourse. So I agree with you that there is a type of Catholic fatalism, perhaps, in Althusser's notion of subjectivity, which you see also in Lacan, because Lacan gets the theory of the discourses, which there is some movement in the theory of the discourses, uh, but there's not the arrival, I would say. I mean, Lacan doesn't posit the arrival of something like absolute knowledge, knowing in the discourses. It would result in what he calls semblant in some sense which is why Badiou calls Lacan a great anti-philosopher in reality. And I think Badiou's right about that. So is Althusserianism, because of its Lacanianism, uh, force Marxism to not hop over into Hegelian idealism is one way to say what you're, what you're saying. If that's true, just like with Nietzsche, just to be clear, uh, Lacan, Nietzsche, or any anti-philosopher needs to be worked with not canceled. I'm just going to always say that in anything I say about my Nietzsche studies. It's just a new reading. It's a new... Uh, 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 because you see, I think perhaps some of the ways that we pose these problems, uh, we're now posing them perhaps differently. Because I think in your Althusserian days, maybe this is a question for you, could you see the critique that you're now articulating? Or were you not yet aware of it? Maybe that's a biographical point about your own intellectual um, evolution. But I'm out of curiosity. That's one question. And then also, what drew you out of this Althusserian orientation? Yes, um, I could see the problem because I, I did write something about it. But um, it was one of those things where, do you know, it's, it's a bit like... Um, for as long as uh, if, if the question of consciousness came up, I could say something, oh, emergence, something, something, you know, and that'll do. That's a holding position. And with the Althusser, um, my sort of position was there does seem to be a problem here, but this system is so beautiful and fecund. Uh, in fact, I, I still 
you know, think you can get a great deal out of the notion of structural causality, contradiction and overdetermination. Um, I still think that uh, it's, I don't take the E.M. Woods view that uh, Althusser ineb inevitably led to, you know, class treachery and postmodernism and so on, but I can see where that's coming from, but that's, uh, I think that um, it's, an it's an irony given that political Marxism is basically bastardized Althusserianism. Um, but and she, and she doesn't have any constructive desire to work with it. She's she's sort of um, she sort of leaves it at a critique of a of its own form of fatalism, in my opinion. Which is why I think Isabel Garo actually says it's problematic, but we must work with it in X Y Z way. And you seem to be working something similar. Well. Um... One of the questions you you put there was what caused the sort of uh, the rift, and to be honest with you, it's it's one of those things where um, I think I would have been less attached to Althusserian uh, ideas had I not been so roundly abused and attacked for being an Althusserian in my last years in the SWP by comrades who th thought that this was um, basically a, a route to um, either a Maoist madness or Eurocommunism. Um, not without some degree of plausibility, it has to be said. Um, but, um, you know, when you're... Uh, and so I, I basically um, felt that this was an unfairly attacked position and one that had always been travestied in the tradition that I came from. Um, so I, I, I found over the years that while I still find Althusserian concepts useful, it wasn't, I wasn't so passionately attached. Um, that's the one thing. The other thing is, um, you, as you probably have noticed from my writing, I have a lot of interest in theology, um, and I've always been uh, faith curious. In fact, I've, I've, I would say I've got faith envy. You know what I mean? Um, those who manage to have that um, have always elicited in me a sort of wistful desire. Um, and I'm not saying that I've come to any faith position or anything like that. I'm what Dun Scotus somewhere calls a wayfarer you know, um, seeking truth. Um, and so I read um, on China Mievel's recommendation, a book by the uh, socialist theologian, David Bentley Hart. He, if you know him, he's in the DSA. Um, he's, you know, culturally quite conservative character um, and fascinating and uh, has a rhetorically beautiful. But he wrote this book on the experience of God, which on the face of it is an answer to the new atheists, you know, basically saying, what you think God is is not is not what we're talking about. You're not, you're not even arguing with the right things, and it's a uh, it's actually much more than that. It's a really profound meditation on being, and knowledge, and consciousness. And when it got to the point of arguing with the um, uh, you know arguing the point about consciousness, um, I found myself unable to um, defend my prior sense that consciousness had to be some sort of material thing. Um, and that provoked a productive crisis. Um, it, on the one hand, um, there was a, a bit of flailing um, because I, I was like, well, 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 what about if little bits of consciousness could emerge, like, you know, you get an, a, an amoeba, and that has a little bit of consciousness, maybe then the switch uh, isn't so drastic. It's still a qualitative transformation. And this is a version of what uh, Hart somewhere calls the um, pleonastic fallacy, the idea that you can overcome a qualitative distinction with uh, a series of tiny little distinctions. Um, so basically, I've, I find that there was a, a problem uh, at the core of my theoretical understanding. Um, now, uh, I... I wasn't so upset by it. I wasn't, as C.S. Lewis put it somewhere, miserably liberated. I was actually quite happy to discover that I didn't, I didn't have to worry too much about being uh, coherently materialist. Uh, and in fact, that metaphysically, um, the doors have been blown off. Um, in other words, uh, it might not be um, the cold, um, indifferent universe that I'd assumed it to be. Um, whatever it is. Um, and to be honest with you, I, did, I hadn't realized how basically metaphysically depressed I was because I, you know, I, I'll tell you something else. My fondness for Nietzsche always derived from a certain sense of, um, uh, you know, we are building socialism against the odds. 
against the fundamental structure of reality. And we should still do so. Um, and, you know, occasionally there will be miracles and breakthroughs, but we are struggling against what is fundamentally a, a characteristic violence of reality. And that kind of led me to um, uh, sort of embrace some some liberal politics, maybe, uh, pluralism and so on. I don't reject that. I think that that's still val valuable. But it was a kind of very depressed position to be in. There's one in which socialism is, uh, if we're going to get socialism at all, it will have been uh, achieved against the course of uh, the grain of existence. Um, and if we're, uh, rather than it being the case that ultimately we are haunted by Eden, you know, as the sort of eschatological challenge to our current mode of existence. Um, and rather than it being the case that, um, as again, uh, Hart puts it, uh, one of his essays, that inside even every blithering neoliberal naive, there is a lurking Kropotkin who knows perfectly well that the rational way to exist is for us to share and for there to be uh, s such relative plenty among ourselves that uh, desire can never be really fully satiated. It can never alight on a, a single object that is capable of satiating it. Um, you know, the, uh, this is where, you know, Lacanian desire becomes the rational desire for God, um, which you can never reach as a finite, psychologically limited being. So this um, uh, led me to think, well, maybe all this time I've spent hating on the Hegel bros um, and being um, contemptuous of their their sort of covert idealism. Um, maybe I wasted a lot of my youth, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I've been digging deep into Hegel, um, the phenomenology, the logic, and um, obviously reprising Lukács. Um, and um, the next step is Schelling. Um, I'm not sure where I'm headed, basically, but that all of that has led me to... Um, Sort of, uh, uh, I, I think maybe one way to approach Althusser would be to say, if you radicalized his presuppositions, you would end up uh, in, you know, back with Hegel or something, um, I, you know. But um, so, you know, my position is basically that I think that the most likely uh, state of affairs is that um, idealism is true, correct, absolute idealism, not subjective idealism, and that. Uh, at a certain level, that is indistinguishable from a metaphysical materialism. Uh, Leclerc talks about this. I mean, he's very uh, familiar with um, uh, European mysticism um, and wrote an essay about this, um, where essentially you're both saying that um, the universe consists of only one substance. Um, the ideal, okay, but the ideal also includes the material. No, nope. the material, okay, but the material also includes the ideal. At some level, both of these claims are absolutely identical. Um, and so therefore, to me, it doesn't necessarily um, require you to um, deny the existence of matter and of material constraints. It doesn't deny the localized version of materialism that we, we talk about when we talk about historical materialism. Um, Terry Eagleton, who um, is basically, um, you know, covertly a Catholic theologian, um, uh, makes the point that essentially, you know, I mean, he wrote a book on materialism extolling its, its virtues, um, uh, you know, its cultural and political advantages. But within the context of saying, look, uh, that doesn't mean you have to be an atheist, um, which uh, to me is a perfectly sensible and obvious position. But um, uh, what I'm saying here is that in this context, um, it was... Um, striking to me to go back and reread Marx and Lenin, materialism and imperial criticism and so on, and discover in them what I hadn't really been looking for before, but which should have been obvious when I was reading previously, that there is basically an idealist pulse in there. And I don't care if um, we end up saying, but that has been dialectically sublated. It remains part of the picture. Um, so that's why, in short. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that. I'm excited to see some of these threads in your book on 
the history uh, and the status of self-help, which I'm assuming may may make some appearance. Uh, but but sounds like Richard, you need to uh, uh, devote yourself to an entirely new series of projects based on these spiritual proclivities and interests. I mean, you, you remind me of um, one of Lukács's uh, students uh, and also contemporaries, Lucien Goldman, in his book called The Hidden God, which puts forward what I find and always struggle with of Pascalian Marxism, right? So the task is sort of to to sort of um, um, push, push towards a, a wager on the universal, push on a wager as, as almost it's kind of like a better, I always like to think of it as like a better version of decisionist politics, because usually we have this poor Schmidtian idea of decisionism that we have in political philosophy and political thought. But uh, Goldman shows that Pascal um, immunitizes uh, the question of the wager uh, basically into, uh, he basically says that modern proletarian politics is still fighting the same grand, if you like, spiritual schism that was opened by St. Augustine, right? Over this question of you said, which takes us back in a way to, to Marx's debate with Feuerbach, because I do think that the Pascalian Marxism has a danger of anthropomorphizing the absolute in this kind of notion of an abstract humanity that we decide. And you can see as we progress into a very foreboding future with ecological catastrophes on our horizon, you can see the uh, Manichean spiritual mm, dimension of the class war, especially if the Marxist understanding of the class war is ultimately between two primary classes. Yeah, uh, you, you, you sort of bring in a, a strange a dualism that I, we should probably avoid. Um, but nonetheless, Goldman is worth is worth reading. Um, and um, yes, and so this is all very interesting, Richard. Tell us, um, if you don't mind, uh, as we sort of uh, begin to wrap up, um, A, how, the, how your research is going right now, um, tell us about the, maybe as a continuation from our last conversation, do you have a date by which the book on self-help is going to be, to be out? Um, no, um, the book on self-help hasn't, uh, you know, uh, hasn't been sold yet. I mean, it, it will be, there'll be no problem with that. I just, uh, have to get my arson gear. I've been working on disaster nationalism, um, which is, uh, going to be out next year, probably. Um, and that's that's a more immediately interventionist project. Um, just to say, I mean, in terms of, um, uh, you know, you, you're right that some of this will feed into the book on self-help because I think self-help is basically a corporate version of spirituality. Or rather, there's a kind of contradiction there between self-help as a kind of democratic post-Christian spirituality uh, emerging from the transcendentalists and so on. Um, and self-help as uh, a commodity. I mean, they're two, they, they, they point in radically different directions. Um, and um, yeah, I, th I think um, there, there will be some, uh, you know, I think, I, I think the only realistic uh, way to be, uh, you know, to offer self-help is to be some sort of Marxist. But um, I don't know if I can get away with making that case in the book. I wish oh. It's interesting, as one aside, if I might, uh, you know, we have, I've been doing some work on this notion of the therapeutic and the mm. critique of the therapeutic that comes out of right-wing Freudianism, such as Philip Reif and to some extent Christopher Lash. And it's interesting what you said also that I wanted to mention, which is links, links to this, which is that you mentioned your, your comrade there, um, Hart, the theologian. Mm. He, he's a leftist, he's a socialist, but there is also some, some kind of, let's say, conservative uh, question about morality and so on and so on. Mm. I'm drawn to this um, contradiction. And, you know, I will say that contradiction, as I study the American left and its history, has, especially since the period of the new left, 60s and 70s, really been a recurring motif, right? Which is this kind of um, great schism that tends to emerge in which... Uh, yeah, we, we sort of have this debacle on our hands whereby um, we have a certain sensitivity and certain alarm bells emerge to socialists that are 
entering into fields of study, even of morals, religion, etc., or yeah. fa family, etc. And one of the interesting things I'm finding, apropos the legacy of Philip Reef, because Reef is the godfather in this domain, yeah, uh, is that you know the working class. I have a new article coming out on this. Is turning to self-help in a way which is fundamentally different than the way that Lash thought that it would go. It's not that it's it's rather that self-help is being turned to not to foment some kind of narcissism epidemic. Yeah, uh, it's functioning much more um, uh, much more as a substitute uh, source of sustenance yeah. or a type of lifestyle that is being deprived. Right. Yeah. As a survival necessity. So self-help has taken on a fundamentally different quality yeah. than I think Reef and Lash critiqued. But nonetheless, there's aspects of their critique of self-help industry, of course, which I think are very, very sound and also which um, bring us back into this other problem, which we discussed before. Perhaps you have a different read on it now, which is that the Reef and Lash critique of the left in its own conception of uh, uh, self-expression, polymorphous perversity, um, radical horizontalism, etc., cetera, um, according to Lash and Reef, ends up um, creating a kind of stunted uh, subjectivity, a sort of um, collapses possibility of solidarity. So you can see how that critique will just um, form uh, an artificial, I would say, schism on the left, mm. where 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 um, what we think is sort of what what is being diagnosed or treated or objectified as a conservative tendency doesn't actually really reflect a conservative tendency. It really reflects something different, and we sort of need a different language. For example, some people will say even the study of Lash will produce. Uh, a tendency for a kind of post-leftism, a kind of dissatisfaction with the left, will produce a fascism, will produce, uh, I don't know, uh, um, et cetera. And um, I don't know what you make of that. I don't know if you, um, how you might parse that out. And it, it, I, I apologize for my um, spontaneous reflections, but perhaps some of that might resonate with you. It does. I mean, first of all, I, I love Lash's work, so I, I don't care if I if, uh, if I get cancelled um, uh, for that, because uh, I think he's highly productive, even though you're right, he becomes a very conservative thinker, kind of post-left thinker. Um, although, actually, in terms of self-help, I noticed that in his uh, later writings, um, he becomes more interested in traditions of self-help that are being lost um, to corporate culture, you know, um, and t traditions of self-help in the sense of, you know, community structures, everybody helping one another out, being able to, you know, uh, just in my lifetime, uh, one of the ways in which you could help yourself was uh, you could fix your own TV, you could sew your own jeans, you could sew your own socks, you know, like stuff like that. That's becoming less and less possible because, uh, you know, like, we got fast fashion now. There's no point in sewing anything. Televisions can't be opened up in the same way. Technology is black boxed. We're being excluded. We're being uh, epistemologically, that's not the right term, but in, in that sense, proletarianized, right? So um, in terms of um, the moral critique, and I, I get the ambivalence there. And actually, you know, um, that's always been my ambivalence about uh, religion, you know, like, has religion ever been realistic about sexuality? Uh, I asked Comrade Mayville about this, and he says, you hesitate because you'd be the most vanilla person in the room, um, which uh, it's, it, I mean, given the record of religion is probably true. I actually think there would be an interesting kind of um, theology of kink, uh, if your listeners would be interested in that, where, wherein essentially you see, um, you know, the um, the fortuitous, uh, the adventitious, adventitious and um, yet totally remarkable fact that, you know, whatever turns you on, turns you on, like uh, it could be, you know, some some fetish or whatever, um, uh, with the miraculous, which is the redemption of evil and suffering, you know, where, you know, like uh, somebody says, please beat me, you know, or, uh, you know, please stage a rape fantasy or something like that, something truly evil, but turns it into um, the overcoming of evil and suffering. 
cruciform or otherwise. And um, you experience a kind of incipient theosis there. That's tendentious, obviously, but I'm merely saying that um, there are ways uh, into this domain that don't lead to emotional terrorism and moralizing. Um, and, you know, if there's one thing I despise, it's um, moralizing and any form of scolding, which is something you don't do to equals. And to be fair, I think if you read Hart's uh, translation of the New Testament, it's pretty, it's got pretty solid politics, actually. Um, in terms of the stuff about um, self-help um, as a, as a kind of... Um, narcissistic tendency i think you're right in your critique i think one of the things i notice is that uh, self-help is often quite punitive um and bossy um and that's true um in the stoical uh, sort of self-help departments quite a lot of books recommending stoicism and so for some people i think if you like have anger problems or something that might be useful for you but i think fundamentally that is an expression of political despair I think that, you know, there's an argument, I forget um, the author, forgive me, I, I can't remember her name, um, this happens to me all the time, but she basically described how uh, self-help is basically a, a form of modern American optimism, you know, that no matter, uh, political optimism, no matter how bad things are, there's nothing Berlin. fundamental. Berlin. Huh? Berlin. Yes, yes, that's the one. So... I think it's the obverse of that now. I think it is absolute political despair. It, it is saying to you, um, at, at, particularly at moments of crisis where it becomes very popular, it is saying to you that your best bet is to become what Hegel called the unhappy consciousness. Well, hold on a second. Actually, I was. let me just be clear. Eva Alouz, in her new book, The End of Love, makes a slightly different point, which I find interesting because it yeah. actually brings us back to a, a class uh, point, which is that... Uh, in a, a, a situation after 2008 in which social reproductive avenues for the achievement of a feeling of self-worth are increasingly unavailable yeah. to young people in that so if you don't mind muting, uh, in that scenario self-help becomes an, an avenue as a replacement for traditional things like marriage kids etc what does that mean for working class people, it means to fully, finally not become your mother. It, it, it means to fully and finally uh, uh, overcome traumatic experiences that you've had, etc. So it's in this more, I don't want to use the word authentic, but in a sense, it, it, it's true that, that self-help is actually resonating at this level, which is why we're seeing um, the proliferation of... Um, these kind of intimate connections across Instagram, social media, et cetera, for deeper forms of the achievement of, of avenues of self-worth and self-making that are no longer the avenues that the old Fordist state apparatus promised. That's very, Lash and Reef never could see that come about, but I think we're living that right now. That's that's very perspicacious, and I like Eloise's writing a lot. I haven't uh, I haven't got uh, through that book yet, but uh, rest assured I will. And that that sounds like a very productive line of inquiry. It just strikes me that several of these readings might be true in parallel because we're talking about there are different lines of self help. Um, but I think that that uh, is a very productive reading. Um, I think in general, though, uh, my interpretation of self-help is that it's fundamentally in its roots, um, uh, 19th century roots here. I'm not talking about the ancient Greeks or whatever. Uh, although Foucault has the reading of the ancient Greeks uh, that where the, for them it's about freedom. Well, I think that's what the 19th century self-help movement is about, how to live freely um, in an age of rising democracy. Um, and uh, most of the time you see in the, in the UK, we associate self-help with Samuel Smiles, who uh, comes across quite a conservative figure, is quite condescending to the working class. He bigs up all these self-made entrepreneurs and so on. But actually, he was um, initially part of the radical wing of Chartism. I mean, he was never a class struggle kind of guy. He didn't like that stuff. Um, but uh, there was a radical politics, there were radical dem democratic politics there. Um, and he drew a lot from Emerson and the transcendentalists and they in turn learned a lot from him. And uh, so it's a, 
th there's a kind of a combination of uh, Kantian uh, philosophy, post-Christian uh, theology, and uh, radical democratic politics. And the idea is how can how can we live freely? And I think that um, you know to go back to the unhappy consciousness and Hegel's rebuff to that. You know, that basically this is a form of consciousness that only really thrives in situ situations of slavery and terror, right? Um, to achieve real freedom requires a transformation of uh, object. You, you, it requires objective freedom as well as subjective freedom. In other words, there needs to be some sort of uh, dialectical uh, sublation of the, t the opposition there. Um, and that basically to me is socialism. Um, and... Uh, so, uh, therefore, the question would be, what would a self-help um, discourse be like? And I agree with you that there's a sense in which it's replacing parenting. Because certainly, I mean, I'm of the generation that sort of, I'm, I'm somewhere in between. You know, I still had fairly traditional parenting in some respects, but also I feel like I didn't get a lot from my parents about how to orient myself in this world. I don't think they would have had any idea. Uh, you know, because they were they were born in a different world and they grew up in the era of Fordism. Um, and also just the, the culture was different. Um, they didn't know what was coming. Um, and I think that a lot of us are um, orphans of history. I think that's what our condition is today. I mean, certainly more so for younger people. And in that context, the uh, sprawling industries of self-help are addressing a real desperate need for people who... Basically, you know, what do you do when your mum and dad can't tell you how to do it? Um, and where you don't have a community, you know, and you can't rely on. And also, you know, there's the growing friendship crisis, you know, the deficit, like especially among men. You don't have friends to talk to. And even if you did talk to your friends, they've probably been reading it from an MRI website or something, you know, like it's it, there's a real crisis there. People need um, some sort of um guidance and i think it would it's a shame that that has to be come with such a heavy helping of bullshit and um ideology um uh, and you know system serving um obfuscations so uh, i i think maybe the, uh, the the trick is to find a way to bring out the radical uh potential imminent in it but for me it it, it ends where lukacs uh, ends up in 1968 saying you know, that essentially the self-education of the working class is going to consist of a uh, socialist organization of society. Um, but that, to me, also points back towards what I was saying about uh, sort of consciousness and the centrality of consciousness. Somebody uh, wrote that consciousness is communion. And I think that that's fundamentally the nature of consciousness. There is no consciousness as monad. Right, other and that that is why it matters so much how consciousness is mediated and collectivized, um, and therefore we won't achieve freedom until we address consciousness on that level, um, and that's the level typically that we're talking about when we talk about the material conditions of our existence. It's not just you know objects and you know uh, metabolic flows of labor and energy and all the rest of it. It's that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Every time you talk, Richard, I think to myself, well, I should just stop it here because nothing can nothing can rival what would come after. Um, but um, I, I promised you an hour and a half and it is a Friday. Um, so <laughs> I do want to uh, respect your time um, and I want to thank you for this very um, exhilarating, frankly, conversation and frankly, uh, inspiring conversation as well. So we must um, do it again. Perhaps we can start a whole new Richard Seymour wing of the podcast where we just bring you on to riff with us. Um, and uh, there was no plan to this conversation. And I suppose it was a musically quite quite a riff. Uh, and I enjoyed it. So, yeah, I, I, these, these I really enjoyed that kind of conversation. And uh, I'd be delighted to come on again. Um, and um, I will... I look forward to finishing your book and I will let you know. Aha. Yes. Very ominous. You will let me know. Yeah, let no, me... no, not at all. I, I actually, uh, I mean, I've been reading it. It seems like a great book to me, but you know, I, I mean, I expect to be able to praise it to the skies. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. No, it's, well, I mean, it was a, it was, it was a whole thing. It was an uh, up at 4am 
labor of love in a classical sense of the term. That's wonderful. So I do, I do hope you, I do hope you find some benefit from it, given your strong Nietzschean uh, history. Um, yeah. So we'll close, and uh, thanks everyone for listening, and we'll have Richard back on again, no, no doubt. Thanks again.